Welcome to this uh, event on World AIDS Day. I'm thrilled to welcome you to this briefing that SAGE and our HIV Aging Policy Action Coalition is proud to host in collaboration with the Congressional LGBTQ Plus Equality Caucus and the Congressional HIV AIDS Caucus. We'll be focusing on the challenges of older people living with HIV. It's generally great news that people living with HIV are growing older. In fact, one in two people living with HIV in the United States is over the age of 50. Yet this also presents challenges. And we'll hear about all of this, including the personal stories from, of people from communities across the country who are currently living with HIV and who are older folks. And we'll also hear about possible policy, policy solutions from our amazing panelists, followed by some time for Q&A. But first, I'm honored to welcome Douglas Brooks, who directed the Office of National AIDS Policy under President Obama, and who currently is the Executive Director of Community Engagement at Gilead Sciences. All right, Douglas, the floor Thanks, is yours. Thanks, Anne. Uh, so we at Gilead are really proud to support the work of SAGE and the HIV Agent Policy Action Coalition, which is funded under Gilead's uh, HIV AIDS Positively Initiative which is a multi-year commitment to organizations working to improve the health and wellness of those uh, aging and living with HIV. We'd like to thank the staff of members of the Congressional LGBT Equality Caucus and the Congressional HIV AIDS Caucus for joining this important conversation. We know that your members have a multitude of policy issues that require their and your attention so we all thank you for taking the time to receive a briefing on this policy topic. As a person over 50 living with HIV, I'm personally familiar with some of the issues that can arise as a result of aging with HIV. Simultaneously, as we commemorate this World AIDS Day, I'm also painfully reminded that aging with HIV is a relatively new topic because it's a relatively new possibility on a large scale. Today, I'm remembering the scores of friends, colleagues, and clients that are no longer with us and who would have welcomed an opportunity to age with HIV. For many years, we could not have imagined that people living with HIV would be aging into Medicare. So I think this briefing and your concern, attention, and commitment to people living with HIV is an excellent way to honor their lives and their deaths. I have the honor of knowing most of the women and men on today's panel, and I can guarantee that they bring a wealth of knowledge and in some cases, personal experiences on the topic of HIV and aging. So let's listen to them. And again, we at Gilead, thank you for your attention and your leadership. And we look forward to working with you in the 117th Congress. All right, thanks so much, Douglas. We really appreciate you being here today. And of course, Gilead support. I don't know if I mentioned at the top, but my name is Aaron Tax and I'm the Director of Advocacy at SAGE and welcome again to this briefing. And with that, I wanna turn it over to our first pa panelist, Alejandro. Uh, please introduce yourself, your pronouns, your affiliation and take it away. Hi everyone, my name is Alejandro Acosta. I am currently HIV Advocacy Coordinator for Equality Florida. Down here in Fort Lauderdale, I have no pronoun preference and um, we are part of the coalition of that SAGE has put together with Gilead. So we're very proud of being part of this today. Um, Florida is a unique space and we all know that. And, and we have been reminded with COVID-19 that healthcare decisions are made by politicians and that education of lawmakers is very important. So down here in Florida, we are strongly trying to change the laws. The laws of Florida's HIV laws have not been revised since 1986. So we're still having people, at least 35 people arrested each year on HIV related offenses. And this is affecting and impacting uh, people over 50 because we are indeed a retirement state. So a large population of Florida uh, is, is, is a retirement and 50 plus. And we know that at least 125,000 people in Florida are living with HIV. Unfortunately too, HIV continues to be one of the main issues that we have to deal with right here in Florida because of access. We have um, problems with access as well as still very strong stigma. Um, we have also a one party dominated uh, government, which means the, the House and the Senate and the governor are all Republican. 
And at times it has been very challenging trying to get the message anti-stigma across. Um, so we cannot end stigma. We will not be able to end HIV by 2030 like the ending the HIV epidemic is trying to do. Uh, we also have to recognize that our, our, el our elderly, right, our 50 plus, which I'm almost there, I'm 45, uh, we're still very sexually active and messaging and education of the community itself has been uh, forgotten. And I think that there is a space and an opportunity to go back to educating, especially people who are sexually active, not only about HIV, but STIs and, and policies that affect them directly, um, like expansion of Medicaid and, and the Ryan White program, all these issues that some, some people might be unaware of that are very important for, for our aging population as well. Um, we also in Equality Florida are trying to educate not only lawmakers, but our members and our community, because sometimes some of that stigma is still very embedded within our own communities. So we, we must recognize that there's a lot of work to be done still within the LGBTQ community um, overall in terms of discrimination. And when we add HIV to that, that mixture, uh, it can be explosive. So in Florida, we're number one for HIV transmissions in the nation. We really are trying to change that. There is no reason why over 4,000 people are, should be uh, being diagnosed each year as a new transmission. Uh, I had three minutes to present. I like to stick to time. I had zero seconds left. Uh, and I will bounce it back to Aaron. Aaron, thank you so much for this opportunity again. Well, thanks so much, Alejandro, for being here. And thanks for staying on time. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Cecilia. The floor is yours. Hi, thank you for inviting me um, to be here today for this briefing. My name is Cecilia Zhang. I am in San Francisco and I work for Transgender Law Center and I'm a transgender woman, 55, living with HIV. Um, I think that it's really important when we talk about HIV and aging that we pay some attention to the needs of transgender people living with HIV. We made up of about, about approximately 3% of the HIV um, populations. And yet, you know, there's a lot that we still don't know about um, treatment for transgender who are aging and living with HIV. For instance, um, we have a history of um, incarcerations homelessness, and also mental health issues. So as we get older, these problems don't go away. Um, it actually will amplify it because as we age, you know, like um, I'm, our mental capacity would deteriorate. And so um, a lot of that relies on our tech caretakers and some of us don't have families with us and live in isolations. And that becomes even a bigger challenge. Um, the second challenge is that um, identity documents to some of us who are, um, 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 growing older, um, it's still a challenge because not all of us have our name change documents in place, which means that when we seek care as we get older, we will come across like more barriers um, around like being misgender um, and also transphobic attitude. Um, a lot of us frown on the idea of like moving into any care facilities for that very reason, because as our physical capacity diminish, you know, the um, ability for us to advocate for ourselves also um, diminish. And, and at that time, who is going to advocate for us? Who is going to make sure that people don't misgender us, make sure that, you know, they use the right name and the right pronouns. And most important of all, um, for most people, it takes for granted that they don't have to think about these things because they have family to take care of them. But we also have to talk about when um, it's time for us to be near our deathbed and when we die, we want to make sure that our gender identity and names are respected all the way until we get buried. I know that it's a morbid topic, but for transgender people, that respect all the way until after death is really crucial. Um, I also have like a three minutes um, limit and I don't want to like over um, use my time as well. So I'm gonna yield that to the next speakers. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Cecilia. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Wilfred. Hi, everybody. Saludos desde Puerto Rico. Um, I am Wilfred Labiosa, Executive Director of SAGE Puerto Rico and its supervising entity, Ways Ahead. My pronouns are he, him, él. Puerto Rico is an aging community. Um, it's a country 
older adults 55 plus will reach 42% in just few years from now. There are over 20,580 plus cases of people living with HIV and AIDS and only 16,800 plus receiving services, leaving more than 3,658 not receiving services. Out of all of the those living with HIV and AIDS, 63.3% are all adults living over 50 plus, and six to 8% of these are either MSM, gay, or transgender individuals. The lack of data is a challenge for all of us here in Puerto Rico. We need to know with certainty the needs of the LGBT older adult living with HIV AIDS. A comprehensive needs assessment on the segment of our population has never been done in the island and is needed. Anecdotally, in our experience confirms that lack of housing, job stability, economic and finances and mental health related issues are but some of the issues impacting our population here living in the island. We shall continue to advocate for services focused on our older LGBT plus adults living with HIV AIDS, diversify the agencies receiving funds under the Ryan White and other related funding sources to address the needs of the population living here in the island, including those retiring in the island from mainland US living with HIV and AIDS and aging. The need to provide mental health services by and for the LGBT older adults living with HIV and AIDS exists as the island not only confronts devastation, physical from and trauma left behind by the hurricanes of 2017, earthquakes of late 2019 and 2020, fiscal instability, and it's also confronting the highest incidence of anxiety, depression and suicide attempts, as well as death by suicide. From the 2,640 plus each year of suicides, over 85% are death by older adults, 50 plus. Data provided by local Department of Health confirms a different scenario from that of continental US in regards of death by suicide. I want to I confirm that we are here and that we here in Puerto Rico will continue advocating for those living with HIV and AIDS living um, 50 plus. Thank you for listening and supporting the work of SAGE nationwide, including Puerto Rico. We refuse to be invisible and advocate now and always for our brothers and sisters living with HIV and AIDS 50 plus in the island and abroad. Thank you very much. Gracias. Thanks so much, Wilfred. We really appreciate that. Uh, next, I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Lopez. Uh, yes, hello and good afternoon. And thank you all for having me here as part of this very important coalition. My name is Michelle Lopez. I am a woman, um, 54 presently, and I, I want to spend some time with you today talking about uh, the clinical aspect of some areas where I want to, I'm going to be recommending. I am saying I'm going to be recommending because I am someone for the last 28 years, I've been diagnosed 30 years now living with HIV. In 1996, I received an AIDS diagnosis um, because um, I was someone that recently had gotten over a uh, PCP pneumonia, which is an opportunistic infection, and also to toxoplasmosis, which was an infection of the brain that I contracted because my immune system was so low. I contracted this from cat feces, um, again, and because of my dwelling mode. I outline these things because today, here in New York, I work at a wonderful organization, and that's GMHC. What I do here at GMHC, I'm what you call the healthy aging specialist. And what does that mean that she does here at GMHC? Well, I am providing mental health screening and substance use with alcohol screening for any adult that is 50 and over that is aging. Uh, you could be aging with HIV, you could still be at risk because many of us are still sexually active and we are still having difficulties getting and addressing our uh, sexual health needs. So it encompasses within my outline today, talking about our mental health needs. And for those of us, again, who are aging uh, now with HIV, I can speak to there is a need of a policy. I am recommending today 
that we must have a policy written into our care and treatment guidelines because of the symptoms many of us are presenting with. As I stated earlier, I am 54. I had my first geriatric screening appointment with a gerontologist and two things she identified for me right away. And at that time, this was the early part of this year, um, I was, you know, aging as my aging continues. And she looked at me and she said, Michelle, you are going to be 54 because I saw her before my birthday. She says, but you have a profile of a woman 62 to uh, 65 years old. That's your clinical profile I'm seeing here. That right there was an, a clear indicator for those of us who are aging. As we hit the age 50 and we start, we continue with the aging, we are living longer. Uh, many of us are now engaged in care, but we are not just diagnosed with HIV. We are also too diagnosed with what we call comorbidities. And because of these comorbidities, the experience that I have as someone that is aging, I am also too diagnosed with diabetes. And because my A1C has been, you know, it's, it's not under control. It's one of the major challenges. I am fully, I am undetectable. But because of these comorbidities, there is also an impact it is having with my viral load. So because of this experience, clinically, there is a need that we should have a policy written for those of us who are aging and we are engaged in care, we must have at least one annual geriatric screening, a consult, so that the geriatrician can now be part of our care team. This needs to be written into our care and treatment guidelines because of the symptoms many of us who are aging is presenting, there needs to be where there is a full team approach, including, again, I'm gonna repeat it. I'm not being redundant. I'm repeating this. We need to have geriatric care written into our care and treatment that we are now navigating to support our medical needs. I want to be able to have every one of my colleagues present and uh, give their information today. And I greatly appreciate Sage again for having me being part of this coalition. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Michelle. We really appreciate it. Next, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Meadows. I think he's having some trouble with his video, so you might just hear him as opposed to see him. Hey, can you hear me, Aaron? Yes, we can. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, I'll be brief. I, I want to speak on behalf of my best friend who's li been living with HIV for 35 years. Uh, earlier this year, uh, out of the blue, his insurance uh, in increased the cost of his medications by, by 300%. He wasn't able to pay for his uh, antiretroviral treatment anymore. And uh, his, uh, his viral load went up, his CD4 count went down. He, uh, he was in a situation where uh, no program was helping him. Uh, he, he could either pay for his house note or take or pay for his medications. And he chose to pay for his house note. Um, after many months, he allowed me to pay for his prescriptions, but he is still in a situation where his viral load is up and his, his uh, CD4 count is down, which you know, puts him at risk for infection. It puts him other people at risk of having it transmitted. Um, and I, I don't think in the United States anyone should be in situation as they're aging with HIV. And uh, I don't know what can be done to help someone like him, but I don't want to see this happen to anyone else. Thank you. Everyone, that was uh, Jim Meadows uh, with um, Sage New Orleans. Uh, thanks so much for being here. I'm now going to turn it over to Malcolm Reed down in Georgia. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Malcolm Reed. I'm the Programs Director for Thrive Support Services. And before that, I founded an organization, a group within Thrive, um, supporting Black gay men living with HIV over the age of 50. Um, I, <clears throat> I founded that group because I didn't see myself in any of the, a lot of the other organizations that I went to. And today I want to speak to not only about Black gay men living with HIV over the age of 50, but I want to speak about 
um, people in, in Georgia who, for whatever reason, may not have the access to care that they need, um, especially when it comes to telehealth. Uh, the COVID-19 emergency, we've, we've uh, supported the relaxation of rules and laws relating to telehealth. And these changes during the public health emergency make sense, but that raises the question, why don't they make sense after the public health emergency? Uh, when dealing with seniors, people living with HIV, as well as underserved communities, communities of color, um, um, people living below or at the poverty line, um, a doctor's visit involves transportation. One of the things that we do at Thrive is when we link people to care, we, we provide a transportation to them through Uber or Lyft, and we do that with grant money. But what about the people that don't have access to an, to an organization like Thrive or don't know about an organization like Thrive or don't know about an, another nonprofit? You know, uh, people don't realize that sometimes car fare um, um, is, is, is a barrier to accessing health. So when you think about some of the things that we have done during the COVID-19 emergency with um, telehealth, we can understand that people who are poor, who can't get to their doctor or who are living with a mobility issue and they can't get to their doctor require a better health, um, um, telehealth um, laws. Right now, the Alliance of Connected Care is tracking 42 bills. Um, I'm not gonna go over all 42. That would be way over my three minutes, but there are four of them that, that, that I'd like to point out. Um, Senate Bill 4230, the Telehealth Expansion Act of 2020 would expand access to mental health services in certain evaluation and management services furnished through telehealth under the Medicare program. Um, what, what I am attracted to by all of these bills that I'm gonna mention is that they are not just specific to the public health emergency. They're talking about changing these laws permanently. Um, next, House HR 7391, to protect the Telehealth Access um, Act would remove certain geographic um, originating site restrictions on the furnishing of telehealth services under the Medicare program. HR 7338, the Advancing Telehealth Beyond COVID-19 Act would permit the Secretary of Health and Human Services to waive requirements relating to the furnishing of telehealth services under the Medicare program. And finally, 40, um, Senate Bill 4515, the Access the Internet Act would authorize $2 billion in funding for distance learning and telehealth initiatives including 400 million for FCC's COVID-19 telehealth program. So, you know, you, you take that 2 billion and you're just taking 400 billion million for COVID-19, the rest is left for permanent changes to the infrastructure um, to increase telehealth. In closing, I just wanna say that um, services by that, I mean, uh, uh, excuse me, polls by that same organization have uh, revealed that the, the perception of telehealth among people over 50 is slowly um, increasing. Um, people are starting to feel better about telehealth visits with their doctor. Yes, they wanna see their doctor um, face to face. My husband and I just went through some medical issues and there were times when it was like, okay, these phone calls and these, these internet visits aren't doing it, we need to see our doctor. And we were able to get in there. But when it makes sense, we need to change the telehealth rules so that people do not have to leave their house to go to the doctor. I think about all the times in New York before I moved my mom down here in 2012, when she had to climb down the stairs in the icy New York snow and go to the doctor. It makes no sense. And if it makes sense to change those rules during the public health emergency, um, we need to look at some of those laws and some of those rules and make sure that we can change them and going forward. So thank you for listening to me today. I appreciate it. I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Malcolm. Um, and I'll re reiterate how crazy it is to have to leave your house to use telehealth. Doesn't really make much sense. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sean Cahill. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, so uh, I'm Sean Cahill. I'm Director of Health Policy Research at the Fenway Institute at Fenway Health, and I use he, him pronouns. We are a health center and a Ryan White HIV clinic, and we have about 2,200 patients living with HIV and 4,000 patients on PrEP for HIV prevention. Um, the Biden-Harris administration should reestablish 
the Office of National AIDS Policy to centralize HIV leadership at a high level. ONAP requires con congressional funding and the next ONAP director should prioritize the needs of older people living with HIV and long-term survivors. Second, the needs and concerns of older adults with HIV and long-term survivors must be central to the HIV National Strategic Plan, which uh, was just released today. Older adults and long-term survivors should be designated as priority populations in that plan. We need continued deep collaboration between the Ryan White HIV AIDS program and the Administration on Aging on policy and services, including training all elder service providers, including home care aides, uh, so that they are competent to provide affirming care to older people living with HIV and also older LGBTQ people. Ryan White and the AOA should require ongoing collaboration between local area agencies on aging and state integrated HIV care and prevention planning bodies. Uh, as Michelle mentioned, older people with HIV and long-term survivors often struggle to access geriatric care, which many need in their 50s due to earlier onset of many age-related conditions. Ryan White and Congress should ensure that people living with HIV can access geriatric care in all Ryan White clinics. And specialists such as cardiologists must be trained in how to provide affirming care to long-term survivors who have lipodystrophy. These populations often struggle to access mental health care due to providers not accepting private or even um, public or even private insurance and due to a dearth of providers. So we would encourage Ryan White to work with Congress, SAMHSA and CMS to address reimbursement and workforce issues. We need continued support for the ACA and Medicaid expansion in the South where half of black Americans live. Thousands of people living with HIV have health insurance thanks to the ACA and nearly half of people with HIV are on Medicaid. Recent political changes may make Medicaid expansion an option in Georgia in the near future. And just two more things. Congress must pass the Equality Act to ensure LGBTQ non-discrimination in elder care and in healthcare. 90% of Americans support LGBT non-discrimination in healthcare and other areas, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation. The Senate must pass the Equality Act to protect the majority of vulnerable older adults living with HIV who are LGBTQ. And then finally, the Trump administration's religious refusal policies pose a dire threat to the ability of older people living with HIV to access care and services in the US. These policies also threaten the ability of LGBT people, sex workers, people who inject drugs and others to access HIV prevention and care through our global AIDS program, PEPFAR. Discriminatory policies must be repealed. Thank you. All right, thanks and thanks to all of our amazing speakers today. We now have about a half hour because everyone was right on time uh, to open the floor to some Q&A. Uh, so if you wanna uh, raise your hands uh, in the Zoom, uh, I will call on you. Um, and if that doesn't work, just feel free to speak up and you can direct your question to any one of our panelists in particular or to all of them in general. Totally up to you. And while we're waiting for that, I'm going to throw out a question uh, that I thought of. Uh, let's see where I wrote it down. One second, if you bear with me. Um, but I guess one of them has been already already been addressed by Sean and some other folks. But if there's one thing that you would hope that the new administration will do, uh, what would it be? Anyone can feel free to take that. One of the things that I would like to see, um, and, and I'm going to use New York State here as an example. Within the New York State AIDS Institute, we do not have a division of mental health. And for me today, again, you know, not being redundant, if I'm in my 30th year and, you know, I'm seeing, I have looked at the different areas that has impacted my livelihood. Um, my mental health today is just as important for me having access and being able to navigate those needs. We need to be able for our health departments to realistically have outline programs, 
and policies, again, related to us being able um, to access mental health care services and needs. It is very key. Some of us have had to deal with numerous levels of trauma in our lives. And now that we are aging, you know, I, I would echo the words of, of many of my clients that I work with, Michelle, I want to be able to die with dignity. Our mental health needs must be, because unless we make these, um, unless we make these changes, it would not be, you know, um, the urgence, you know, of, of states or wherever to pretty much um, have this also too as a prioritization in reference to our aging care. Thank you. All right, thanks, Michelle. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that? Again, any hopes uh, or dreams for the new administration? Aaron, I'll just say that um, I hope and I trust that the uh, Biden-Harris administration will reinstate uh, sexual orientation and gender identity non-discrimination regulations governing healthcare, both healthcare services, but also insurance coverage. Um, those were uh, repealed by the Trump administration in June, but the repeal has been enjoined by a couple of federal district courts. Uh, and, you know, about two thirds of people living with HIV in this country are LGBT. Um, and we do experience discrimination in healthcare. It's widely documented. And so this really undermines the, these policies of the Trump administration really undermine um, you know, the um, ending the HIV epidemic initiative uh, and our ability to uh, really address the HIV epidemic. Um, I'd like to add to that is um, with the HUD guidelines on um, on shelter policy. Um, right now, um, I think um, we are at a crossroad because you know the Trump administration um, is trying to reverse some of the. Um, LGBT protections and shelter policies um, it, um, that have been put in place. And, you know, and for transgender people and other um, LGBT folks living with HIV um, who are homeless, um, having a place to stay is not negotiable. You know, it is a necessity. And, um, and if we are really trying to do the best, you know, for those of us, you know, like who are um, trying to age, you know, gracefully, I think that, you know, that that's where we can like um, put some work into, you know, in our next national HIV strategies is, you know, to look at integrated care that includes housing um, for um, seniors living with HIV over 50. Does anyone else Aaron. have thoughts on this? Go ahead, yes, Wilfred. Aaron. Hi, Wilfred here from Puerto Rico. Um, two things. Michelle started to mention it about the mental health. Mental health has to be part of the health spectrum of people um, from A to Z, meaning from when they first begin in healthcare until their very end. We need to address the trauma and the mental health circumstances that is impacting all of our LGBT community 50 plus. And um, second of all, develop and add the appropriate language that includes LGBT people living with HIV and AIDS in the community development building grants. The language has to be included in order for us, the providers who are the first, in a sense, responders and who are providing the service to add the language that includes LGBT 50 plus and HIV and AIDS. That language is non-existent and that would help Cecilia's point about providing shelter, housing units of different kinds to all of our individuals that we provide services to on an ongoing basis. Thanks, Wilfred. Any other thoughts from anyone? Um, and I'll also note for everyone who's joined us today, if you have a question, feel free to just raise your hand figuratively, literally, and chime in with your question. And hey, um, Aaron, I would say that um, we need uh, an effective Office of National, National AIDS Policy, ONAP. We need to restore that um, and the President's Advisory Council on HIV and AIDS. Um, um, you know, the Trump administration has either um, put the, his political um, friends in place or, or has completely um, um, gotten rid of some of those offices. And, we need the most marginalized people living with HIV to be part of those offices and part of those organizations. Excellent, thanks Malcolm. And I hear that Jules, that you have your hands up. Apparently I can't see the hands up. So 
Yes. Uh, feel free to ask your question. Yes, hello. Uh, pleased to be able to comment here. <clears throat> I, I would like to just add to the very excellent comments by everybody else that um, aging with HIV has become a serious, um, I would call it an epidemic in the HIV community. It's been very much overlooked. Very soon, it's estimated 75% of people will be over 50 in the United States with HIV. However, the care services and support that pe older people with HIV are, are getting is really very inadequate and poor. Um, I would just say that the kit critical, one of the critical points is that due to insurance reimbursement re re uh, restrictions, uh, care visits with medical, uh, with doctors is often restricted, certainly in New York City to 15, 20 minutes. And that is one of the critical overlying problems is that reimbursement is not supporting us. I would also add that the HIV strategic plan is not discussing the aging problem at all. And that the overall community, except for people here today and many others, but the overall community response to HIV has not included the aging problem. So I just want to urge Congress to really consider this as the major epidemic in HIV today, or one of the very top epidemics within the HIV community. Thanks. All right, thanks so much, Jules, for that contribution. Does anyone have any reactions or, or thoughts? Uh, I'll just follow up on what you said, uh, Jules, about the plan that uh, was published today. It was a draft uh, plan, um, an HIV uh, strategic plan, and um, we should all be commenting on it. I think the comment period ends December 12th, so it's a very quick turnaround, but um, we should be commenting and asking them to really beef up the content related to older adults in HIV and long-term survivors living with HIV who are very much an overlapping population, but still distinct and have distinct needs and experiences. Um, and and um, I think that the two populations, older adults and long-term survivors, should be designated as a priority population. I don't understand why they're not in the draft plan. And you know, that brings about... Uh, Thanks so much, Sean. I'll, I'll invite the audience, if anyone has any questions for the panelists today, feel free to raise your hand or just uh, chime in. Um, Aaron, I, I, believe, yeah. um, I believe Tez Anderson is trying to um, ask oh, a question. Go ahead, Tez. Thanks, Michelle. Well, I, was, I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to verbalize it because uh, I wasn't going to do the camera because I haven't showered. Um, <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of things. One of them is this access to mental health care that you're talking about. I saw someone, I mean, someone mentioned what's wrong. What's missing is finding providers who are qualified to, to deal with this population, the aging, the trauma, the early epidemic history, all the, all the issues that we deal with, which are much more complex than a person who is just getting in their hours and are often free or cheap. Um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up was something I've been recently made aware of, which I was just about to type in, was that as on Friday, November 20th, the Trump administration, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, announced that they would establish a most favored nations rule to set the prices of Medicare Part B program. That's a really awful idea. Drug, setting drug prices based on that is awful and we really need to take a strong stand against it because that's not the way to do drug pricing for anything. That's all. Thanks for bringing that up, Tez. Does anyone have any reactions or thoughts? Um, I do see a question in the chat. Uh, this is from Steve Vargas. Uh, how much does the Older Americans Act mention or support people aging with HIV or the LGBT community. And he suggests uh, we should review and update it. So I do have some good news on that front. 
In the most re recent reauthorization of the Older Americans Act in March of this year, it now includes language for the very first time that requires every state department of aging, so-called state units on aging, and every area agency on aging, which are kind of like county departments of aging, to um, engage in outreach to LGBT older people in their communities, to collect data on the needs of LGBT older people in their communities, and to collect data on whether they're meeting the needs of LGBT older people in their communities. I'll flag that we expect two comment periods, most likely in the upcoming year, one through the Administration for Community Living and one through the Office of Management and Budget, where our goal will be to make sure that ACL, the Administration for Community Living, which implements the law, implements these renew rules as robustly as possible so we can get the most out of them and make them as effective uh, as we can. So stay tuned for that. I can assure you SAGE will be pushing out information on that as these uh, comment periods come around. Uh, we have for a long time also been trying to get uh, uh, older people living with HIV designated as so-called greatest social needs populations or target populations. Unfortunately, that did not happen in the legislation this time around. On the bright side, however, we have been making some progress with our allies at the local and state level. Uh, last year, uh, working with uh, uh, um, AIDS Foundation Chicago and Equality uh, Illinois and some others, uh, Illinois became the very first state in the nation to designate older people living with HIV as the greatest social needs population under the Older Americans Act. And uh, just this November, uh, DC Mayor Muriel Bowser signed legislation in DC, uh, making that designation for older people living with H uh, HIV in the district, as well as LGBT older folks living in the district. Um, so we will be advocating for that in other states as well uh, until we see a time when the federal government uh, takes that up. So there has been progress and uh, we always look forward to working with folks on the Hill uh, to continue making progress on that front. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Any other folks who have called in today? So yeah, yeah. Aaron, um, I would like to mention also um, in my role as Fed Policy Chair with the uh, USPL HIV Caucus, one of the things that we would like to see from the um, incoming administration is MEPA, Meaningful Involvement of People Living with HIV. A more focus should be put on clinics. Um, you know, more focus has been put on clinics and biome biomedical interventions, but our voices as people living with HIV have been reduced to patient and consumer. And rather than be an integral part or an integral and important partner in the HIV response, um, we're a diverse group of people and our experiences with finding support, building thriving communities, obtaining quality health care and maintaining the treatment, our treatment plans is important. I know that the organization that I work with, Thrive SS, we are fully MEPA. It was an organization founded by men, black men living with HIV. It is an organization staffed by people living with HIV. And we are successful because of that. Um, we are the ones who know what we need. So um, that's, one thing, that's one thing that I would like to add um, that I would expect from the new administration. Thanks, Malcolm. Uh, I do see a question in the chat uh, from Julia saying, um, speaking of industry, what can innovators do to support this particular HIV population. Any thoughts from anybody? You know, when, when we think about MEPA, we also must think about leadership positions being being uh, filled by, by, by leaders in the community because as well as, as people living with HIV, we need representation of, of, of aging population with voices at the table as well as also a population that tends to be forgotten is the aging population of immigrants who are undocumented and who also faces a set of challenges that goes beyond just HIV. Uh, and I would love to see the administration, the new administration open up some, some dialogue in terms of the care of people living with HIV who are also undocumented. Thanks for raising that up, Alejandro. One other population uh, we probably need to hear more about um, that's particularly impacted uh, by the epidemic is um, trans people of color, particularly black trans women and the impact that the epidemic is having on them. Is there anything anyone can share um, about that topic in particular, why, why that community we believe is so hard hit and what some of the solutions might be to better address that issue? 
Um, I guess I'll be the one like talking about that. Um, in um, one of our needs assessment that we have done recently um, for Positively Trans, you know, project of Transgender Law Center, we looked at family rejection, um, you know, issues, you know, faced by transgender people of color living with HIV. You know, overwhelmingly, almost 80% of um, Black trans people living with HIV had reported a history of being rejected by their family um, since the age of 18. Um, and so when we look at those who are able to be resilient enough and live um, past, you know, like 50 um, who are living with HIV, the chances for them to actually have a family structure to support them um, is like quite minimal. Um, you know, of course, you know, there's always exception to that stories, but, you know, unfortunately, that's the majority of the trans people of color that um, they have experienced like isolations, family rejections at a very young age. And so the trauma of these rejections um, compounded by, you know, like continued social isolations, you know, make it a really um, at risk of poor health outcome for many of them. Thanks, Cecilia. Does anyone else have any thoughts on that or anything to share? This, this year we brought to the Capitol during our lobby days, a, a group of 18 um, transgender individuals identify as living with HIV. Uh, it was the first time in Florida that such a population had shown up to be part of the policymaking process and actually speaking to lawmakers. And I can attest as an advocate who was there to witness it of the impact that it had on the participants. So when we give people the opportunity to to show up and be you know show up as a constituent to a lawmaker, it makes a difference and it does empower them. So I I really believe that giving opportunities is is very important because people are there. We just need to find them. Well, that's a really great point, Alejandro, and it really touches on the idea that we at Sage live by, which is nothing about us without us, and to make sure that older people living with HIV are at the forefront of advocacy on this topic. You know, one theme I'm hearing uh, in a lot of your statements today is how this is more than just a straight up medical issue, that there's so many other factors at play, whether it's housing, um, food, or so on and so forth. Does anyone have any other reflections on that uh, that can flesh that out a little bit of how, how this is more than a medical issue and how there might be ways um, for the federal government or other governmental bodies to step in um, to improve the lives of older people living with HIV? This is Tez. Uh, one of the biggest issues is poverty. I mean, if you're on a social security disability, you're not making a lot of money. I mean, I know some of the folks here are working, but some of us aren't. Um, so I think that the underlying issues of poverty and this impacts on staying healthy, being healthy, finding food that's healthy, getting exercise and doing all the things you need to do Poverty is a huge obstacle, and I know it firsthand. It's not a reason I'm bringing it up, but I also know that I hear it from a lot of people that they can't afford to do X or Y, and that limits their, when we get back from COVID, social interactions as well. Uh, it contributes to isolation, which is enormous, an enormous problem. I, hear, I got a touching email from a guy the other day that was just heartbreaking about how isolated and lonely he felt after you know 38 years of living with AIDS. So it's, 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 I think poverty is the unaddressed issue. I don't know how we address it. If we can ask for cost of living wages, cost of living increases in all the social programs or not, if that's even possible. That's your thing, Aaron. But um, I just wanted to put the word out about poverty and let's not forget we can't all afford this, some of these things. I mean, even HIV conferences cost money, you know? Um, I, I'd like to add to what Ted just mentioned, you know, on poverty, because um, that also translates to um, like homelessness, you know, like those who um, are living on limited income, you know, like um, that, you know, that they might not be able to actually afford, you know, adequate housing or, you know, and, or um, good health housing that, you know, makes it um, easy for them to access services. Um, and so they have to like move to like more rural suburbs area, which um, might not have the adequate health care to support them. And the other issues, you know, like that poverty, um, 
brought about is really food insecurities. You know, like we know that food insecurity is not just an issue for people living with HIV, but it amplifies, you know, like when you have like a chronic health conditions, you are living like um, in poverty on a fixed income and you don't have enough food, you know, that really translates to like more um, challenges, you know, such as, you know, poorer health outcomes and unable to like afford medications when you need to. Um, I know that people were um, mentioning what about ADAP, but there is um, an income limit um, to ADAP. So like if you uh, make over a certain threshold or if you receive, you know, like an income that's over a certain thresholds, you disqualify from ADAP. And so there are a lot of people like are uh, like sitting in that gap, you know, where they can't really afford, you know, like adequate um, food supply or, you know, like, or get the medications they need and yet they don't qualify for any of the services. I think that, you know, in, in Medicare terms, you know, it's called the donut hole. Yes, if I could add. Um, if I, um, I think Michelle's uh, up next and then Jules, then it's all you. Yes, uh, if, I can add, if I can add also too, I, I really want us to be able to address the health inequities that has also too, you know, been been along the line of those of us who fall under these thresholds of being poor, having to utilize Medicaid um, as our method of um, navigating or taking care of our healthcare needs. And for me, I think we have enough um, documentation of the outcomes that these health inequities are doing. So why don't we have a response? a response to health inequities written into our standards of care. Because I think that will then encompass, you know, for those of us, you know, not being uh, facetious in any way, but for those of us, you know, we, we have paid taxes at some point in our lives, but because of situations and circumstances, you know, we have to use Medicaid. So I really would like to see a response um, and this way, um, as I talk about health um, inequities that is going on, we should be able to see a response to health inequities and then that being able to impact again um, here. Well, thanks, Michelle. Uh, Jules, you had a comment. I just wanna add um, um, for people listening to our uh, webinar or discussion who may not be aware of it, that older people with HIV, and by the way, I've had HIV for 35 years, I'm 70 now, and I've been around the community for many, many years doing advocacy work. And for, for people who are not aware, older people with HIV are experiencing, and this has been reported and verified in many studies, older people with HIV, over 60 approximately, and gets worse as they age, are experiencing three to five times the number of comorbidities as people without HIV of similar, similar age. That includes heart disease, kidney disease, diabetes. But uh, in reference to mental health, people with HIV who are older are experiencing grave, serious, increased prevalence of depression, um, isolation, lack of social engagement, frailty, and, and, and one study presented at the big HIV conference this year found that uh, life expectancy is nine years reduced in people with HIV um, and seven years reduced for people who started treatment with 500 CD4s, suggesting that for people who are long-term survivors who had low CD4s when they started under 100 or 200, that survival could be reduced or life expectancy could be reduced 12 years. It's imperative for the federal government and for our authorities to respond to this. To not to do that is insulting and demeaning to our older aging population. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Jules. I'll note that I, we just have a few minutes I would left. Like to, I would like, like to ahead. say right before we end, right, uh -huh. that, that make, there's also a poverty of connection like Hello. Yes. 
And, and so there's a poverty of connection. And sometimes we have to nurture, and this has nothing to do with government, right? But we nurture the interconnection of interpersonal relationships, of intergenerational relationships. And remember that the leaders of, of the past are, are, are those who really paved the way for us. So sometimes as organizations, we should still give opportunities to members of our community to come in, to engage and to connect with younger generations and to share these things. Because a lot of the younger generation is completely disconnected from the realities of, of the older um, people living with HIV. And so as organizations, we must provide some of those opportunities for, to, to have people to come and talk and share. Thanks so much, Alejandro. A great way to end today. Um, on behalf of SAGE and our HIV Aging Policy Action Coalition, uh, a huge thanks to Douglas Brooks and Gilead for making this possible. A huge thanks to Lara uh, with the Equality Caucus and Sean with the Equality Caucus to Sasha on uh, the SAGE team, uh, and to everyone with the LGBT Equality Caucus and the Congressional HIV AIDS Caucus, and all of our amazing panelists today. Uh, we really appreciate your comments. And thanks to everyone in the audience today who also uh, helped with the discussion by raising really important ideas and questions. Um, so with that, uh, we hope you have a meaningful World AIDS Day, and uh, we thank you so much for being here today.